Greetings and welcome to Beacon Unitarian Universalist Congregation. To our members, friends, and everyone joining us in our virtual congregation on YouTube today. Hello, I am the Reverend Robin Landerman Zucker, minister of this congregation. And I will be hosting our virtual worship service today, December 13th, 2020, with worship associate Pia dreisen Niddle, and we'll hear beautiful musical selections from Rumi Wood, Rebecca Prisnick, and our Beacon Choir. We're glad you're here and that you've made Beacon Unitarian Universalist Congregation a part of this day in your spiritual life. Our congregation is spiritually open and intentionally inclusive. Whoever you are and whomever you love, you are always welcome here and we will joyfully marry you here. Our members and friends bring many interests, theologies and viewpoints to our door. And here we trust you will find a common desire for meaningful community and spiritual growth and for relevant personal religious exploration in a framework with very flexible boundaries. Membership in this congregation is open to anyone who chooses to walk with us in the spirit of love, the search for truth, and the pursuit of justice. As I light the chalice, the symbol of our free faith, I invite you to light a candle or a chalice at home and join in the unison words you will see on your screen. We light this chalice with a flame that draws us together. With this flame, we cut through the darkness of isolation and are warmed by the fires of our inner connection. The mission and covenant of Beacon express our values and our vision of ourself as a gathered community in the world. Please join me in saying the mission and covenant of Beacon. You will see the words on your screen. The mission of Beacon Unitarian Universalist Congregation is to be a welcoming community that embraces diverse thought and belief and builds a just, peaceful, and compassionate world. Love is the spirit of this church. The quest for truth is its sacrament and service is its prayer. To dwell together in peace, to seek knowledge in freedom, to serve humanity in kindness, thus do we covenant. And now Pia has some words to open our service during the week of Hanukkah, the Jewish festival of lights. Our opening reading is called The Feast of Lights by Emma Lazarus. Kindle the taper like the steadfast star, a blaze on evening's forehead or the earth. And add each night a luster till afar, an eightfold splendor shine above my hearth. Clash, Israel, the cymbals, touch the lyre. Blow the brass trumpet and the harsh-tongued horn. Chant psalms of victory till the heart take fire. The Maccabean spirit leap newborn. Aruka Tadonoi Eloheinu melakolom, asher kiddishonu ba mitzvoso, vitzivanu lahadlik ner shel Please join me in singing Light One Candle. Light one candle for the Maccabee children with things that their light didn't die. Light one candle for the pain they endured when the right to exist was denied. Light one candle for the terrible sacrifice 
sacrifice justice and freedom demand but light one candle for the wisdom to know when the peacemaker's time is at hand don't let the light go out it's lasted for so one candle for the strength that we need to never become our own fool. Light one candle for those who are suffering the pain we learned so long ago. Light one candle for all we believe in that anger won't tear us apart. And light one candle to bring us together with peace in the song in our hearts. What is the memory that's valued so highly? We keep it alive in that flame. What's the commitment to those who have died when we cry out they've not died in vain? Have we come this far always believing that justice would somehow prevail? This is the burden and this is the promise and this is why we Now is the time in our service when members and friends are invited to share a personal joy or sorrow in the supportive fellowship of this community. This morning, December 13th, we are having a watch party, so we will be pausing during this time to share some live joys and sorrows. We'll also be sharing live joys and sorrows during the post-service gathering at 11 a.m. You can find the links for both the watch parties at 10 a.m., which don't happen every week, but many weeks, and the link for the post-service gathering in the e-news and on our website. You can also send me your joys and sorrows to my email address, minister at beaconuu.com. And during the post-service gathering, we'll also reflect on a question that's related to our theme today. And today it will be, what is your personal experience with the 23rd Psalm? If you are not watching this on December 13th, during the time when we're breaking for our live joys and sorrows, I hope you'll speak your joys and sorrows into the space around you, knowing that in some way they will be held by the energy of our congregation. So I don't have any specific joys and sorrows today that have been sent to me. So I will just say, as I drop this into the water, which is how we symbolize our joys and sorrows, that what affects one of us affects all of us, just like ripples in the water. Let us remember that everyone is fighting their own private battle. We know not what it is, but because we're human, we know it to be true. So let us be kind, compassionate, flexible, and forgiving with one another. And now we will break for our live joys and sorrows during our watch party, and we'll be right back. It was so good to be with some of you live during our watch party to share what's going on in our lives and to share some joys and sorrows. And now I invite everyone into that quiet place where we share intentional breathing, silence, some spoken words, and a musical guided meditation on breathing. So first, if you will, 
Uncross your legs and your arms. Close your eyes. Sit in a chair with your feet on the ground, your arms unfolded, and just breathe. Nothing special. Just breathe. Four beats in through your nose slowly, and then five or six beats out through your mouth slowly, creating a steady stream and seeing how you might create spaciousness, starting at the top of your head and running down an axis to your feet. Just breathing. Four in, five out. Stop and feel. Breathe and allow. Let's breathe together. Breath is your portable, spiritual first aid. You can take it with you everywhere. And it can slow you down, can calm you, can bring you some inner peace. So please continue breathing, four in, five or six out, while I share these spoken words. It's a version of the 23rd Psalm from the Maxor prayer book that lifts up the divine feminine known as the Shekinah. The Shekinah, a sheltering presence, makes me whole, causes me to rest in green fields, leading me to calming waters, replenishing my soul, and empowering me to make life-affirming choices in celebration of God's name. Even though I have walked in darkness and known loss, I have not despaired, for you are with me. Your guidance and your nurturing spirit have sustained me. You have set a full table for me when I have been hurt and alienated. You have conferred upon me unique potential, which I strive to realize. From the deep core of my being, I am overflowing with gratitude. I know that your goodness and loving kindness will continue to abide within me and I will live out my days in God's house. Let's continue breathing together along with the breathe in, breathe out meditation we've been sharing from week to week. Just breathe.
Our reading today is Reciting Psalms by Rabbi Lawrence Kushner. At a summer institute where I was teaching a class on the meaning of sacred text, we studied a Hasidic story which taught that the text not only described, but actually contained the event itself. If read properly, the event could be summoned and relived. This reminded one student, Milt Zaymond, of something he had done as a boy more than 60 years before when his uncle had pneumonia. In those days, people did not go to hospitals like they do now. My uncle lay in his bedroom and the doctor, a good man, came out and told my parents that the end was near. I'm sorry, he consoled, but I don't expect him to live through the night. We helped the doctor on with his coat and saw him to the door. Come, said my father, taking my hand. We have a job to do. He set me down next to my uncle's bed, sat next to me, opened the Bible, and recited a psalm. Then he gave the book to me. Now you read. When I finished, he took the book from me and read the next psalm. And so it went all through the night, the two of us reciting psalms, one after another. When morning came, my uncle was still alive. The doctor returned. He was amazed. He said he had never seen anything like it, that it was a miracle. My father smiled respectfully. He washed his face, had a cup of coffee, and went to work. He never said a word about that night. My uncle lived another 40 years. My sermon today is entitled Psalm 23, I Shall Not Want. The beeper went off at 2 a.m. I was curled on a thin cot in a stuffy conference room at Massachusetts General Hospital, taking one of my turns as a 24-hour on-call chaplain during a summer of pastoral care training in 1998. The piercing beep made me sit upright. It always had that effect. Someone somewhere in the hospital needed a chaplain. I didn't know why they needed one. They could be dying or a family member could be dead. They might be scared or simply in need of a listening ear or prayer. 
As I got myself together, I wondered, and not for the first time, if I would be enough to fill that need. I found my way to one of the general medicine floors and quietly entered the still darkened room of a woman in her 60s with debilitating arthritis. I introduced myself, to which she kindly but firmly replied, I really want to speak to a priest, dear. Well, this was Boston, after all, land of many, many Catholics, but I explained, and not for the first time either, that the priests were only called in the middle of the night when a patient required sacraments. She didn't appear to be at death's door, so I offered to stay and talk to her if she wanted me to. She seemed disappointed and remarked that she didn't know if I would understand her because I wasn't Catholic. She wanted special prayers, novenas and such, and I didn't know even one novena. Well, you got me there. Even so, we sat together in the stillness as she slowly began to tell me her heart-rending story, how her husband had carried her from room to room for much of their long marriage due to the early but severe onset of her disease. I learned how much pain she had endured, the children and active life she could not have, and how her strong faith had sustained her. After an hour or so, I apologized again for not knowing any novenas, but offered up instead the 23rd Psalm. We could recite it together, I suggested. Yes, dear, she replied. It's my favorite. I took hold of her gnarled hand and we prayed some of the most famous and beloved lines of poetry ever written King James Version, if you please. The lyrical and passionate words transcended our religious differences, our ages, and our circumstances. Together, we traveled through the psalmist's terrain of verdant pastures and foreboding pasture shadow lands. We sat together at the feast. We felt the refreshment of the cup and the comfort of the oil. As Rabbi Lawrence Kushner remarked in his reflection, reciting Psalms, which we heard earlier, the text of the Psalm contains the event itself. And if read properly, the event can be summoned and relived. There, united in the dark valley of her room at Mass General Hospital, the woman and I became the Psalm. I said, amen. And good night, and I ducked into an elevator, and I burst into tears. Even if I had not been quite enough, the 23rd Psalm seemed to be. I'd never felt more grateful for scripture in my life. In fact, I probably had never felt grateful for scripture very much before that moment. Back in the conference room, I couldn't sleep. So I wrote this bedside dialogue prayer between a chaplain and a patient. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. There is so much that I want. I want to be well. He makes me lie down in green pastures. I am tired of laying here. I wish I could get out of bed. He leads me beside still waters. I feel like I'm in a whirlpool. He restores my soul. Restore my health too, Lord. He leads me in right paths for his namesake. I feel lost. Even though I walk through the darkest valley, I fear no evil, for you are with me. Please don't leave me. I'm afraid and it's lonely and dark at night. 
your rod and staff support me. It seems like such a long journey, Lord. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. I hope my appetite comes back. You anoint my head with oil. Please wipe my brow with a cool cloth. My cup overflows. My mouth is so dry. May I have a drink of water? Surely goodness and mercy will follow me all the days of my life. How many days will that be? And I shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Help me to go home, Lord. Amen. Amen. The words of the patient in this prayer echo the words of longing I had heard so many times at so many bedsides, words I have heard since in my minister's study, in your homes, and in my own heart, especially during this unexpected, long and grueling pandemic and the isolation, fear and uncertainty it has wrought. I am afraid, I am thirsty, I want to be well, I long for joy, I'm devastated. I wish to go home and dwell harmoniously in my house. I wish to leave my house, to gather with family, with friends and at Beacon. I want to make amends. I wish to die peacefully and dwell in God's house. I do not want to be alone. I want to maintain my faith and hope, even though I'm not quite sure what to have faith in. And that faith and hope is often being tested by illness, loss, confusion, and events completely out of my control. The psalm may state, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want, but in our hearts of hearts, there is so much that we want. And perhaps more than anything, what we want and what we truly need is to feel a sustaining presence of some variety in times of despair or crisis, a presence that could be sacred or human or animal that we can count on to abide with us, to hold us, to dwell with us in our pain. This may explain why I like Bobby McFerrin's musical version of the psalm. The Lord is my shepherd, I have all I need. We will hear Rumi sing it right after the sermon. It's one thing to want, and it is another thing entirely to need. Who among us does not need a companion to walk with them in the shadows, to lead them beside still waters, when the world churns like a whirlpool, or to quench our thirst when we're in the desert. Not even the most ardent atheist is able to, or is even meant to, go it alone. Haven't we all discovered that since March? No wonder then that the 23rd Psalm is like a portable shrine universally treasured and invested by even the most self-proclaimed rationalists with a power deeper than intellectual argument or reason. We may reject the Bible and the personal God of our childhoods, but we will keep this special song of David, as I have since I learned it for the first time in Sunday school at Congregation Beth Sholem in Squirrel Hill, my Jewish neighborhood, in Pittsburgh. One could say that this psalm is a kind of talisman we carefully tuck away but not too far out of reach to be brought out when our faith flags, our fears overtake us in the deepest darkness and our souls yearn for restoration. So I say blessed be for the 23rd Psalm and the balm of comfort it can bring 
to each of us through the words and images of our choosing. The enterprise of personalizing Psalm 23 is helped along by a veritable plethora of versions crafted over the centuries, including the one I shared earlier with the Shekinah, the female divine in the place of the Lord, a more male and patriarchal version. For some of us, that patriarchal formation of the classic text with he and the Lord may not only be distasteful, but hurtful as well. Having numerous renditions from which to choose gives us permission to substitute language and imagery that speaks to us spiritually. Very Unitarian Universalist. One modern mystical tradition that I believe, or translation, that I believe captures the emotional intimacy of the psalm refers to the Lord as sacred beloved and speaks of being led in the path of goodness to follow love's way. A table is set in the presence of all of my fears, and in the end, we dwell in the heart of the beloved forever. It's beautiful. In yet another modern translation, we sit and laugh in the company of our enemies. We give thanks and sing praises, and in one version, goodness and mercy pursues us pursues us, doesn't just follow us, pursues us. And in others, we have no doubt that these virtues will attend us. In one text, we fear nothing lurking in a dark ravine. And yet in another, a table is prepared in the full view of our tormentors. McFerrin also gives us the sacred feminine, as in, there is nothing that can shake me she said she won't forsake me. I'm in her hands. One of the more amusing versions comes from a 19th century Scottish preacher who wanted to connect the psalm to his sheep herding audience. The Lord is my shepherd, he intoned, I, and more than that, he has two fine collie dogs, goodness and mercy, with him before them and them behind, even poor sinners like you and me can hope to win home at last. In addition to the many versions we might select to help us customize the most personal and yet most universal of prayers, we possess as many different reasons for why Psalm 23 speaks to us so powerfully and so poignantly, especially speaks to our hearts. For one, it captures the loneliness and uncertainty that are inescapable conditions of being alive, of being human. We live in a world where children die of cruel diseases, terrorists blow up buildings with airplanes, an unhinged anti-Semite shoots up a synagogue on the Sabbath. We're living through COVID-19, racial and social unrest, and an unhinged attempt to subvert democracy. Psalm 23 offers us a sanctuary where the divine and the human meet, an oasis of solace in this desert of chaos and reversals. A rabbinical translation from 1977 suggests that the psalm teaches us how to make the best of uncomfortable and undesirable conditions. Sometimes a person yearns to move on, explains the Zen-like rabbi, but his attempts are frustrated and he is tied to one place. In this case, he must believe it is the very best place on earth for him. But conversely, sometimes a person yearns to seek down roots in one place to establish himself securely, but circumstances force him to flee. And this too is for the best. Accept it gladly and live in calm repose beside tranquil waters. If only this were so effortless. Sounds quite idyllic, utopian, and well, unrealistic, doesn't it? I recall officiating at a funeral some years ago in Boston, during which we were regaled with one amusing story after another about the deceased a dynamic man in his 50s who had died quite suddenly of a heart attack. 
We laughed a lot together that morning. And yet the moment we began a unison recitation of the 23rd Psalm, heads lowered, tears flowed, and a powerful solemnity filled the sanctuary. The Psalm tapped in to the collective need for comfort in the congregation, and yet offered a place for each person's pain. As such, the Psalm became an intensely intimate experience an inner lament from one individual, much like you or me, fighting his or her own private battle. This morning in the advent of solitary spinning dreidels and subdued ho-ho-hos, some of us are descending into a holiday season that is more barren valley than verdant pasture. We mourn the loss of holiday gatherings and traditions, and we're just weary. You know better than anyone what battle rages in your heart and your soul. Maybe you are grieving the loss of a loved one or a relationship, or you've lost your job and with it your sense of self. The money may be running out or a family member requires assisted living you cannot afford. Maybe you've received a frightening diagnosis or your child isn't thriving or you just feel like you've walked through the shadows long enough and you are ready for daylight. If so, I walk with you. This community walks with you and the spirit of Psalm 23 walks with you on your journey. The typical trajectory of the Psalms themselves represent a journey of sorts from lament regarding the threat of enemies to praise for God's rescue and protection. So Psalm 23 is quite unusual in that it begins with the assurance of the shepherd and the safety of still water, and then it moves into the valley of enemies and out again towards a hopeful future of goodness and mercy. That's much like the trajectory of our human lives, I'd say, safe harbor to shadow land and back again with as much grace faith, honesty, courage, and humor as we can muster. It's widely accepted that the Psalms are properly understood as a collection of songs created by David, a sweet musical shepherd who became king of Israel. They're written from the perspective of a people who worship a God who they believe cares about them personally, much like the way a father cares for his child, or in this case, a shepherd cares for his sheep. Note the psalmist's confidence in that relationship. He writes, the Lord is my shepherd. One can imagine the Maccabees, those famed freedom fighters in the Hanukkah story, reciting this psalm of confidence in their God as they stormed down from the hills to reclaim and rededicate their temple in Jerusalem. Envisioning God as a shepherd and personal guardian, it sounds reasonable and even flattering, doesn't it? After all, Moses was a shepherd. Jesus has been referred to as the door of the sheep. And even Mohammed has argued, no one can be a prophet who has not first been a shepherd. Yet scholars have noted David's chutzpah, or nerve, in assigning God the role of shepherd, since shepherding was one of the lowliest professions in the Near East. These scholars surmise that the choice reflects the steadfast loyalty of the shepherd and his conscientious tending of his flock. A good shepherd will fulfill the basic needs of his sheep no matter what, much like God provided for his people in the wilderness. With the shepherd on duty, they shall not want. This must explain the New Yorker cartoon I clipped out some time ago in which one shepherd, one sheep, side eyes his keeper and says to another, don't tell old straw hat over there, but the Lord is my shepherd. Even so, this timeless poem gives us a powerful and emotional dance between faith and doubt much like the one lived out by us modern creatures thousands of years later. I'm guessing 
that most of us want and need a shepherd, whether or not we believe in the psalmist's personal God or in any transcendent deity for that matter. And why shouldn't we? The thought of being totally alone is just too much to bear. And the reality of being totally alone, as some have discovered these past months, is too much to endure. And yet, in the shadowy valley, in all of our darkest moments, the 23rd Psalm is not a test of our faith. It is an admission of our imperfect humanity. We're not expected to be perpetually fearless or fragrant with oils or at ease in green pastures. Yes, we long for this and we wish to be led there as often as possible. Goodness and mercy may follow us. Righteousness may meet us at the crossroads, but the road will be bumpy and the cup might be empty when we are in the most need of refreshment. The poem speaks to us not of what we should be, but rather of a faith always becoming and restored moment by moment on the journey. It speaks not of fearlessness, but rather of courage and hope summoned in the face of fears. It doesn't demand sainthood, but instead a pledge to live in harmony with oneself, with one's foes, and with one's ground of being or source of truth and meaning. Again, Rabbi Lawrence Kushner reminded us, if read properly, the Psalms become real. And that phenomenon may capture the essence of true faith in a nutshell, experiencing not some paradisal fantasy, but rather the full reality of the human condition, alone and shepherded, thirsty and refreshed, broken and restored, moment by moment by moment. The writer Kathleen Norris speaks to this practical and mysterious power in her book, Amazing Grace, a Vocabulary of Faith. She writes, my husband once went into a depression so severe that he had to be hospitalized for several weeks. I was stunned to learn that we had no medical insurance. In his descent into despair, he had canceled it. But I also comprehended that this was the least of our problems. Finding out who my husband was, she writes, who I was, and rebuilding our life together, those were the critical things. One day at the height of the crisis, I was talking to a friend in New York City who asked, well, what are you doing for yourself? Are you seeing a counselor? Did you get someone to give you a prescription for tranquilizers? No, replied Norris then startled herself by saying, I'm okay, I've been praying the Psalms. And that's enough, her friend asked, incredulous. The funny thing is, said Norris, it was enough. Only you know, what is enough for you? Enough to get through a human life that is not all still waters and bountiful tables. There have been and will be and are now foreboding valleys, burnt fields, raging rivers, dry foreheads, and empty cups. Only you know how to recognize your shepherd in the shadows. Please don't allow pride or embarrassment to keep you from the comfort that awaits you there. Allow your inner lament to be heard. Beloved shepherd, Watch over me. Take my hand and don't let go. Walk with me in a dark and dreary land. I'm thirsty. My forehead is parched. Help me to face my fears and discover my strength. There is so much that I want. Help me to remember and keep faith that I may already have some of what I need, so may it be. Shalom, blessed be, blessed we, and amen. Beside the still water, she will lead. 
There is nothing that can shake me. She has said she won't forsake me. I'm in her hands. She sets a table before me in the presence of my foes. She anoints my head with The spirit of generosity and gratitude flows through Beacon. Each week, whether we are here in our sanctuary or here in our virtual sanctuary on YouTube, we take an offering to support Beacon and our programs. There are two ways for you to donate. You can go to our website, beaconuu.com, find the donate button and make a secure online donation through the Vanco application. We ask that you use your bank account rather than a credit card because it'll save us some fees and there will be more for Beacon. Or you can send us a check to our address, 510 North LaRue Street, Flagstaff, Arizona, 86001 with offering in the note. Either way, we so appreciate your generosity during this especially challenging time. And finally, when we do gather here together, which we hope to do as soon as it is safe and possible, we form a circle at the end of our service and we hold hands and we feel, tangibly feel, the power and connection of this community. While we've been meeting virtually, we've been doing that ritual virtually. So I invite you to imagine us together in a circle, holding hands, feeling the power and the love of Beacon. Because wherever we are, we are Beacon, always connected. Please join me in the benediction that you will see on your screen. Go out into the world in peace, have courage, hold on to what is good, return to no person evil for evil, strengthen the faint-hearted, support the weak, help the suffering, honor, all beings. Stay safe and well. Blessed be, blessed we, shalom and amen.
Santa 